I think I'm there. Okay, I'm gonna give a very, very short uh, talk about um, what's called itelescope.net. The first thing is, what is it? itelescope.net is a network of connected high-end telescopes located and professionally maintained in Australia, Chile, Spain, New Mexico, and California. It's intended for professional quality, deep sky astrophotography. It has different monthly membership fees that range all the way from $20, 40, 90, up to a thousand. So there are some people that are on obviously uh, research grants that are funding this, but basically the rates depend on the specific telescopes you wanna use for, for your work. Um, I personally have used a membership level of about $40 a month, which as an old retiree is about what I can afford. To log on and use specific telescopes, they have maintained a JavaScript interface that allows you to book time on specific telescopes, which each have different rates, to plan imaging times on specific targets, and also to select filters such as our, you know, red, green, blue, luminance, uh, hydrogen alpha, Sulfur two, oxygen three. You can you can basically create a program that will allow you to select all of these and, and run that for a specific period of time. When an imaging session is completed, uh, a zipped FITS files are all downloaded into your uh, your user account, allowing you to you know, download them and process them into imagery. If there is a failure of the imaging session due to either weather or equipment malfunction. All telescope session charges are refunded. And I've had that happen. I've, I've used it and occasionally a big cloud or a thunderstorm comes by and, and you're done. This is an example of some of the, uh, the, you know, the devices they have. They're a lot bigger than, you know, than I could afford. Um, this specific unit turns out to be one of my favorites. It's telescope number 14 at Mayhell, New Mexico. I've had pretty good luck with it. So the next question is why would a DAS member want to use itelescope.net? You know, we have a dark site, we got Chamberlain, we got all these other uh, you know, personally owned devices. Well, first of all, it, it gives you the ability to remotely image deep sky objects, which are only visible in the Southern hemisphere. In other words, if you're looking at something in the large Magellanic cloud, you're not gonna see it very well from up here. The other thing is it gives you the ability to access large professionally calibrated and maintained uh, telescopes uh, allowing multi-hour imaging sessions. I can't do that with my home telescope. I can sometimes get 20 minutes and then I start to get comma. This is an, a real quick example. This is Thor's helmet. Uh, this oh. was a three hour image with, uh, with RGB filters. It's a monochrome uh, camera on the thing and then you apply different filters on it. Another, some other quick ones. This is the Gabriella Mistral Nebula. And this was another one that was available was uh, the Comet Leonard. But at any rate, that's what you can do with itelescope.net. Uh, you, uh, you can use it when the weather is bad here in, in, uh, in Denver. Uh, sometimes it's better in Spain or in Australia. Great, anyway, that's all I wanted to say. My minute is up. <laughs> Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Uh, you can end your screen share now. Thank you. And I will turn it over to July to introduce our special guest speaker. Hello, everyone. Um, 
Tonight we have our guest speaker is Dr. Gregory Wirth. He is a principal systems engineer at Boulder based Ball Aerospace. Uh, clear nights were a rarity when he was growing up in central Michigan, but Greg was smitten with the stars once he identified the Little Dipper. He majored in physics, astronomy, and applied math at Northwestern before heading west to earn his doctorate in astronomy and astrophysics at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Prior to joining Ball Aerospace in 2018, Dr. Worth spent 16 years as a support astronomer at the WM Keck Observatory in Hawaii and later served as the commissioning scientist for the Boulder based National Ecological Observatory Network. After Ball Aerospace, he has supported the Roman Space Telescope program and currently commutes between Boulder and Baltimore. Um, to assist in commissioning the optical systems on the JWST. On the side, he studies distant clusters galaxies with the Hubble Space Telescope and Keck and enjoys cycling the back roads of Boulder County to conduct extensive field research comparing different types of pie. Yummy. Astronomers worldwide were thrilled with to see the powerful new James Webb Space Telescope launched into space on Christmas Day, w JWST's great Primary mirrors were successfully deployed in January and are now being aligned to incredible accuracy to deliver spectacular infrared images to Earth. Ball Aerospace has been responsible for the design, construction, and deployment of the optics on the telescope and will continue working with NASA to refine the optics before handing the system over to astronomers this summer. Welcome to our guest speaker tonight for our virtual banquet, quote unquote. Um, Welcome, Dr. Gregory Wirth. Thank Thanks you. very much, July. I appreciate that. Okay, folks, uh, real honor tonight to be speaking to your club. I was an amateur astronomer well before I became a professional one, so this really takes me back to the days of my youth, uh, spending time with my astronomical brethren. So I'm trying something a little new here. I'm going to actually be presenting from a different computer that I'm speaking on, so we're going to cross our fingers here and hope this works. I presume you're able to hear me okay. Is that true? Great, okay. I'm gonna hit the button here and hopefully we will get a slideshow. Great. All right, so folks, as July said, um, I work at Ball Aerospace in Boulder. We also have facilities in uh, Broomfield and Westminster and several other cities like Dayton and Albuquerque, but the bulk of our spacecraft work takes place here in Colorado. Uh, Ball Aerospace has been in the space business for a long time, since actually 1956, a time when NASA didn't even exist. We build and design spacecraft, sometimes for space science missions, other times for earth science missions. Sometimes we design and build the entire spacecraft, whereas others, we just build an instrument or a system that rides on board somebody else's spacecraft. So tonight I'm excited to share with you the very latest developments from NASA's newest mission, the James Webb Space Telescope, pictured here in all its glory. And there is some late breaking stuff that I am just excited to share with you. So for the last couple months, I've been shuttling back and forth to Baltimore to experience the greatest adventure of my career, commissioning this amazing space telescope. Last week, I rushed from the airport straight to the Space Telescope Science Institute to join a meeting. And after the meeting was done, I heard a commotion and realized that this was not just another day at the office. Moments earlier, my teammates had reached a major milestone in the process of bringing the telescope online by aligning the telescope mirrors to perfection for the very first time. The assorted engineers and science dignitaries gathered in the glass walled conference room shown here beside the Mission Operations Center and we raised a toast to the success of the team. In this photo, NASA's Lee Feinberg explains to the assembled crowd and TV cameras the importance of this moment as Nobel Prize winning physicist John Mather listens from the left side. Let me explain why this milestone was so momentous. Now, early on Christmas morning, NASA and ESA uh, launched the James Webb Space Telescope into orbit on an Ariane rocket from French Guiana. Rising majestically into the sky, that rocket carried with it the hopes and dreams of thousands of technicians, 
engineers and scientists who all contributed to making that dream a reality. It was a magical holiday gift to wake up to, and I hope many of you, like me, got up early that morning to see the spectacular launch. After a 26 minute ride on that rocket, we began a process NASA called 29 Days of Terror that raised the blood pressure of astronomers worldwide as we waited to see what would happen. Moments after the telescope successfully separated from the rocket, the solar arrays deployed and began making electricity from sunshine. As Webb drifted away from that rocket, NASA caught this spectacular image of the back of the spacecraft with Earth in the background. This is probably the last close-up photo we'll ever see of Webb, and what a beautiful photo it is. Now, Webb had to be folded up like a piece of origami to fit within that smaller available space on the rocket. As Webb made its way out past the moon into the depths of space, the spacecraft builders and astronomers held their breath as one component after another delicately unfolded. First, the solar panels provided power, then the optics were raised above the substructure, and then that delicate sun shield deployed to prevent sunlight from heating the telescope. Over the course of several days, the layers of that sunshade were delicately tensioned to stretch them into position. And then the secondary mirror was deployed, and ultimately the wings that hold six of those 18 mirror segments swung gently into place and locked into position. At this point, which uh, took a couple weeks to get to, Webb had nearly reached its final form, and we waited to see how it would actually behave once all of these things were finally in position with very bated breath. Webb's thrusters propelled that spacecraft out of Earth's orbit well past the moon to reach its final destination. The rocket then turned and fired its thrusters again to stop at this point a million miles from Earth, where the Earth and the Moon won't hinder its observations. While it's there, Webb won't be stationary. It will spend the next phase of its life orbiting from a special point in space that puts it behind the Earth as seen from the Sun. Known as the L2 Lagrange point, this spot in space is only semi-stable, meaning that Webb will need to fire its thrusters every so often to stay within this orbit. So before I explain how we built Webb, it's helpful to understand why it was designed this way. You've all heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, the most famous and I'd say the most beloved telescope in the world. That telescope launched in 1990, back during my first year of graduate school, and we're proud that all five of the instruments it now carries were designed and built at Ball. Hubble travels in a low Earth orbit, about 350 miles above us at 16,000 miles an hour, still generating great science after 30 years of service, far more than it was originally designed for. We're all familiar with the beautiful images of planets. We're all familiar with the beautiful images of planets, galaxies, and stars captured by Hubble. It's been used for thousands and thousands of observing campaigns, including my own thesis. But Hubble's done more than simply give us incredible images. It's led us to innumerable major discoveries in astrophysics, ranging from how stars are born in the wombs of massive clouds of hydrogen, to how they die in enormous explosions that create vast and spectacular nebulae that glow in the light of hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms. Hubble has revealed how galaxies like our own Milky Way form and evolve. We can hear the rest of this lecture. Hey. We're going to interrupt you with this, our lecture. How some galaxies merge and consume their neighbors. Well, we did and how others are ripped to shreds in collisions that strew gas and dust through space. Hubble even captured images of supernova explosions in distant galaxies. This allowed us to measure the expansion rate of the universe, discover dark energy, and win three astronomers the Nobel Prize in physics. And it sounds like we've got somebody who needs to mute. If you could check your microphones, please. Back in the 1930s, American astronomer Edwin Hubble, the telescope's namesake, found that nearly all galaxies are moving away from us and from each other. Hubble observed each galaxy's spectrum, the range of light waves that it emits. And he found that those galaxies that are furthest from us 
had their light the most shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. In other words, the wavelengths of light from the galaxies got longer and longer, an effect that we call redshift. Hubble was the first to understand that the redshift phenomenon yeah. implied that our universe is expanding. You can come in here. You will just come in here and just lose. Yes, just... Charles, you need mm -hmm. to mute. <laughs> okay. Um... Like all telescopes, Webb is a time machine. Light travels incredibly fast, but not infinitely so. So when we look out into space, we are seeing objects not as they are now, but as they were when the light left them. And the greater the distance, the longer the look back time. For the sun, we see it not as it is right now, but as it was eight minutes ago when the light left its surface. We see the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, as it was four years ago. So we say that star is four light years away. Galaxies, on the other hand, can be millions or billions of light years from us. We see the furthest galaxies as they appeared in the early universe. The light that they emitted has been traveling toward us for 13 billion years and is just now reaching us. So we can see back using Hubble to a time 13 billion years in the past when only 400 million years had elapsed since the birth of the universe. With Webb, we'll be able to go back even further to a time when the universe was only 250 million years old. And that distinction between 400 million years and 250 million years may not sound like much, but it's important when we're trying to see the first generation of stars turning on. And when you look at a rainbow, you see the different wavelengths of light that we detect with our eyes. Blue light has the shortest wavelength and red light has the longest. But there's light beyond the red that our eyes can't see. We call that the infrared. When light travels through space and that space expands, it stretches those wavelengths of light, creating that redshift. The greater the distance the light has traveled through the expanding space, the greater the redshift. So we need infrared telescopes to see light from the most distant galaxies. Now, infrared light not only allows us to see great distances, but also to detect different things. For example, cold gas in space that doesn't emit visible light, but still has heat energy. The photo here shows the constellation Orion the Hunter, visible in the winter sky, as it looks to our eyes in visible light. The three bright stars in a row are Orion's belt, and the four stars in the corner outline the body. Here's a view of that same region in infrared light, and you can see it's totally different. An infrared telescope shows vast clouds of hydrogen gas in Orion where new stars are being born, light that's not visible to us when we only have Hubble. Infrared light also penetrates through clouds of dust to reveal objects hidden within. The image here shows the Eagle Nebula as seen by Hubble in visible light, an image famously termed by NASA the Pillars of Creation. This image reveals magnificent details in the three giant pillars of cold gas that are bathed in the ultraviolet glow from a cluster of young massive stars. Well, in 2014, Hubble reobserved this nebula again using the Wide Field Camera 3, an instrument ball built that can see in the infrared. And this camera shows images that reveal many, many more stars than you see in the image on the left. These are objects that were previously blocked from view by dust, but the infrared light can penetrate through the dust and allow us to see these stars, giving us a more complete picture of where and how stars form in the nebula. So those are a couple reasons why you'd want an infrared telescope. Now, you also want a big telescope because the size of the main mirror in a telescope determines its power. Large mirrors gather more light, allowing us to see fainter and more distant things. But larger mirrors also provide more detailed images because they can provide better resolution, the ability to discern details. The image on the left shows how Hubble's smaller 2.4 meter mirror compares to that enormous 6.5 meter mirror on JWST. Now for comparison, what we probably should be showing you here is not Hubble versus JWST, but Spitzer versus JWST. Spitzer was NASA's uh, best infrared telescope in space up until now. And you can see that its primary mirror is even smaller than a single mirror segment on JWST. In fact, that Spitzer primary mirror is the size of JWST's secondary mirror. Now, at right, we see a full-scale model of the James Webb Space Telescope. 
That gold surface with the honeycomb pattern is the main mirror that gathers light. And below that mirror, the big stretched out layer that looks like a kite is the sunshade. That sunshade is huge, the size of a tennis court, and it shades the mirror and the instruments from the sun, which would otherwise heat the telescope up and prevent it from seeing faint objects. Webb will be the largest, most powerful telescope ever put into space. Let's take a look at what was involved in putting it together. What was the engineering behind it? Ball is proud to have filed four patents in the effort to design Webb, and three of those were used in the final design. Now, Ball's job on this project was to design and build the telescope optics, all the parts that the telescope needs to see the sky. Our team built these shiny mirrors shown in these pictures. This photo shows our main products, the 18 segments making up that huge primary mirror, plus that circular secondary mirror sitting in its stowed position near the top of the image. There's also a black nose-like structure protruding from the center of the mirror. That's called the aft optics assembly, and that contains the tertiary mirror and the fine steering mirror that I'll get to later. What you don't see here are the special software and motors that control those mirrors, but we'll come to that. Now, Webb is a reflecting telescope. Once all the primary mirror segments are aligned, they act as a single curved monolithic mirror. Light from the object Webb is observing first hits that primary mirror, gets reflected to the secondary, and then travels through the aft optics assembly where the tertiary and fine steering mirrors are located. That light is then directed to the various science instruments. With its three curved mirror surfaces, Webb is technically known as a three-mirror anastigmat, or a TMA optical design. Now for the optics gurus in the audience, I'll explain that uh, the reason we designed Webb as a TMA and not as a standard Cassegrain-like Hubble is due to image quality. Both the standard Cassegrain design and the TMA perform well on the optical axis but they differ in what happens off the optical axis. My ball teammate Garrett West and his colleagues at NASA are experts in optics and they study mirror designs. And they produce this diagram above. This is a plot that shows on the x-axis how far off the optical axis you're observing. And on the y-axis, how much wave front error you get. In other words, how well focused are the images? What's the image quality? And the important thing to note here is the difference between the green line at the bottom for the TMA and the blue lines that represent the, uh, the Cassegrain designs like Hubble. And you can see there's not that much of a difference between the red line and the blue line when you're on axis at that zero position. Uh, let's see if I can get a laser pointer here. But uh, the lines begin to diverge when you get a couple of arc minutes off the optical axis. The Cassegrain image quality degrades rapidly, whereas the TMA image quality remains so nice, uh, even a long way off axis. And that's why the TMA act, uh, option is the preferred design, to take advantage of the sharp image quality that you can get with a telescope in space. Now. On to the mirrors. Here's one of the mirror segments, one of the 18 hexagons that compose that primary mirror. It's been coated with a thin layer of 24 karat gold because that gold surface reflects really well in the infrared. And we have uh, more light than that reaches the instruments because there are multiple reflections, multiple mirror surfaces involved here. We ended up using about one golf ball's worth of gold to coat all the web mirrors combined. And the mirrors are very highly polished so that we can capture every single photon possible. About those mirrors, here's a view of the back of a primary mirror segment. Now, it turns out NASA chose Ball to make these mirrors because Ball's design performed the best of the various candidates that NASA originally evaluated. Remember, Hubble had mirrors made of glass. But Ball's mirrors for Webb aren't glass at all. They're a metal called beryllium, which was chosen because it holds its shape really well in the cold of space. Each of the 18 segments started off as a solid slab of beryllium weighing almost 600 pounds. And machinists at another company basically carved out the back of them using a CNC mill, according to Ball's structural design. 
and ended up reducing each segment's weight from almost 600 pounds to less than 50. So the optics became 90% lighter. On the back of this mirror are seven important things known as actuators, tiny mechanical motors that can move the mirrors and change its curvature. Ball's engineers had to invent actuators that could move tiny amounts, nanometers at a time, in order to make these mirrors align perfectly. There's also that center actuator with the long struts attached to it that can actually bend the mirror and change its curvature as needed to allow us to make the mirror act like one single perfect surface. Now, anything with a measurable temperature emits infrared radiation, including the telescope itself. So for Webb to be able to see the infrared light from faint objects in the depths of space, we need to keep the telescope as cold as possible so that it doesn't generate light that interferes with what it is trying to see in the distant universe. How do we do that? The main line of defense against heat is this giant sun shield, which divides the telescope into a hot side and a cold side. On the hot side that faces the sun, the temperature is about 185 degrees Fahrenheit. And on that cold side, where the mirrors and the science instruments are shielded from the sun, it's about minus 390 degrees Fahrenheit, almost a 600 degree difference between the hot side and the cold side. And Ball's engineers found it challenging to design cryogenic electronics that would work in the frigid cold space. When building a spacecraft like Webb, we have to perform many different tests to make sure that our hardware will work. That means we have to test our hardware under the same conditions it will operate in when we're in space, a cold vacuum with intense sunlight and cosmic rays. But there were major challenges to doing that on Webb. Mainly, Earth's environment is different from space. You can't reproduce the space environment perfectly. We can simulate some aspects of it, but you can't remove gravity to simulate zero G. A second challenge is just the size of Webb. It's huge, and it can't fit within most existing environmental test chambers. So to get around these challenges, our engineers rely on computer models to simulate the behavior of spacecraft components. We make structural models, we make thermal models, we make optical models, and we conduct tests to validate those models, starting with smaller component level tests and building up to large observatory level tests. Only by doing extensive testing and modeling can we be sure the observatory will function in space. Because unlike with Hubble, NASA is not going to be sending astronauts a million miles away to repair anything that breaks on web. It has to work right the first time. Now, Ball needed a way to ensure that the alignment process would work in space. How to do that? Build a mini web. In our laboratory in Baltimore, we constructed this one-sixth scale James Webb Space Telescope to be a faithful representation of what the optics of the real telescope would do. We have the same 18 segments. They have actuators on them, just like the real mirrors, and we use it uh, to create images and simulate the process of aligning the mirrors. Uh, we'll take a closer look at this system later because it's really quite amazing. But let's talk about those beautiful uh, mirrors. To align mirrors in space, you need a mechanical system capable of making highly accurate moves to nanometer precision. This is where those hexapods I talked about earlier are so critically important. Those seven hexapods on the back of each mirror segment allow us to adjust the position of that segment in several ways. You can tilt the segment both left, right, and also up, down. You can rotate the mirror clockwise or counterclockwise. You can translate the mirror from side to side, and a motor in the center even allows you to change the shape of the mirror. And you need all of these adjustments in space to get those 18 mirror segments on web aligned to act like one single giant mirror, which is the whole point of this process. Now, things in space don't work the same way on Earth, so we try to simulate that space environment in a test chamber that has very low temperature and the pure vacuum of space, which is basically extremely low air pressure. 
For Webb, we used the huge thermal vacuum chamber at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama to do some optical tests. And here we see one of Ball's test engineers preparing six of Webb's segments for that environmental testing. In this chamber, we'll lower the temperature down to almost 400 degrees below zero to simulate the conditions in space under which Webb will operate. And if the mirrors work well here, we can be confident they won't warp and change shape in space. We also vibrate the optics and mechanisms to ensure they can survive the extreme shaking during those first 10 minutes after launch when the rocket is firing. And we use an acoustical test chamber, blasting intense sound waves at the hardware, again, to simulate our launch conditions. Testing web was a challenge because of the need for a big enough test chamber. There's only one place in the world that could hold the fully assembled telescope, and that's the famed Chamber A at Johnson Space Center in Houston, which dates from the Apollo Moon Program. This one is as tall as a seven-story building, and it was just big enough to fit the telescope with the secondary mirror fully deployed. It took 10 days to pump out the air and recreate the airless, frigid environment of space, and then another month to lower the temperature of the telescope and its science instruments down to what we expect in space. And here we see the test engineers proudly posing with the telescope back in 2017 after it survived its 100 days of cryogenic testing. After environmental testing was complete, the optical elements and science instruments were shipped to California to the workshops of Northrop Grumman, the prime contractor for Webb. Northrop attached the telescope and the sun shield to their spacecraft bus to perform the final testing. Throughout 2019, engineers and technicians at Northrop integrated the optics of the telescope with the instruments, the sun shield, and the spacecraft bus. They gingerly lifted the optics and secured them to the bus, taking great care. Once they finally put everything together, then it was time to test that sun shield. They unfurled and carefully tensioned the five layers of that sun shield just as they would later do in space. If you ask many of us associated with the program what we thought the riskiest part of the mission was, we probably would have said this sun shield part scared us the most. Because when you build something to operate in space, you generally try to keep it simple and reduce the number of moving parts. But the sun shield has a tremendous number of things that move, many single point failure opportunities there. But the engineers who built it were confident it would work, and by golly, they were proven right after Webb launched. Here's my ball teammate, Larkin Carey, removing Webb's aft optic subsystem cover. It's kind of a lens cap for the system. That cover kept the instruments clean, contaminant-free, and safe from stray light while it was assembled and fully prepared for flight. But it was not perfect. Rumor has it that one enterprising spider was able to penetrate the secure clean room and make itself a home in this area, which leads to the ultimate question. Was that spider literally trying to create its own Webb telescope. So here's an interesting aside. There's an enterprising Lego fan who's designed this amazing model of the James Webb Space Telescope and has gotten the community to support it and vote for the company to consider producing it as a set you'll be able to buy in stores. It's incredibly true to the real design, down to the mirrors, the way they move, the instruments are on there, and the entire thing even can fold up like the real Webb. The design's now in the final stages before approval for production, and someday maybe it will appear in stores. But what I find fascinating is that for the ultimate realism, they even added their own Lego Larkin, just like my friend Larkin Carey. And in my world, there is no higher form of praise than to be depicted as your own Lego figure. Hats off to my friend Larkin. Last August, engineers finally finished Webb's comprehensive testing in California and they packed it up for launch. This video shows the outcome of that process, carefully folding up the telescope into its final origami shape. The sun shades being stowed, the optics folded up. It's remarkable how compact this large telescope is. And perhaps what's even more incredible, this telescope is many times the size of the Hubble Space Telescope, and yet it weighs only half as much when all is said and done. It's a remarkable feat of engineering to have designed this amazing telescope to be so light and yet so powerful. One dark night last fall, 
Webb took a slow ride on a truck to the port in Los Angeles, where it was quietly loaded onto a custom-built boat that took it across the Panama Canal and to the launch site in South America's French Guiana. And interestingly, for safety's sake, NASA kept the details on the sailing plans a secret, just in case any modern-day Pirates of the Caribbean had designs on kidnapping this $10 billion treasure for ransom. After Webb launched, my team still had to wait several weeks for the telescope to deploy and cool down before we could start the critical work of aligning those telescope mirrors. Let me explain to you our plans and how it has worked out. Here's the big picture. When we start the alignment process, Webb is not one telescope, but 18 small separate telescopes, one per segment. Our task is to align those segments so they each send light to the same spot. We can adjust the position of each of the 18 segments in various ways to make them align. When we start, the telescope's unaligned and unfocused. We start by getting the focus roughly correct. Then we move the segments so that they all put their light into a large array, one in which we can make out the position of each segment. Then one by one, we move those segments into that small array and then to the center. What I'm showing here in a matter of a few seconds actually takes us several months because the mirrors move very slowly, literally as fast as grass grows. Okay, that's the big picture. Now let's go through the details of the plan. The very first thing we need to do is determine where in the sky we're pointing. That's the first task when we have this telescope. But we have a general idea where in the sky we're pointing, but the exact position is just a guess. So we start by choosing a field with some recognizable pattern. And we take a picture with NIRCAM, the main camera, the infrared camera on web. At this stage, the image will be out of focus and very confused because the segments aren't aligned yet. But this is at least enough to get us pointed in the right direction, quite literally. The next task is to locate the segment images. We do this by running a task we call image mosaic. Each Near cam image sees only a small part of the sky, and we need to search a broader region to locate the segment images. So we point the telescope at a bright, isolated star, and we move the telescope to capture a series of images. We stitch those images together and form a picture of this part of the sky. We call that the mosaic. But remember, we don't have just one mirror looking at this star. We have 18 mirrors, each of which is initially tilted toward a different part of the sky. As a result, we actually capture 18 slightly shifted copies of that star's image, each one out of focus and uniquely distorted. We refer to these initial star copies as our segment images. In fact, depending on the starting positions of the mirrors, it could take multiple iterations to locate all 18 of those segments in a single image. Then we move on to the next step, segment identification. One by one, we wiggle those 18 mirror segments and observe which spot on the sky moves. That determines which segment creates which segment image. After matching the mirror segments to their respective images, we can tilt the mirrors to bring all those images to a common point for further analysis, arraying them in something we call the image array. And we don't have to put them in the same shape as the segments are on the telescope, but that turns out to be a convenient way to place them. The outcome here is that we get an array that we can work with where we understand where each of the segment images is coming from. And from there, we move on to the next stage, which is segment alignment. In the segment alignment stage, we correct most of the large positioning errors of the mirror segments. We begin by moving the secondary mirror slightly to defocus the segment images. We use a mathematical technique we call phase retrieval to analyze those defocused images and determine the precise positioning errors of those segments. We make adjustments to those segments to produce 18 well-corrected telescopes. However, at this point, the segments still aren't working together as a single mirror. That's still to come. Next, to put all the light in a single place, each image has to be stacked on top of another. In this next stage that we call image stacking, we move the individual segment images so that they all fall precisely at the center of the field 
to produce one single unified image. We start by stacking the inner or A segments, then we begin moving the Bs and finally the Cs. This process prepares the telescope for the next thing, which is coarse phasing. In the coarse phasing stage, we will begin correcting the positioning of the segments relative to the secondary. So even though we've got the images on top of each other, we still don't have a fully working infrared telescope. Now at this stage, the segments are still acting as 18 small telescopes. They need to be lined up to an incredible accuracy, smaller than the wavelength of light we're observing. We end up doing this through the three times during the whole process of aligning the telescope. What we're going to do is measure and correct the vertical displacements of the mirror segments using a technology called dispersed fringe sensing. We take a spectrum of two segments light, and that light will interfere, uh, the light from the two segments will interfere with each other and create this barber pole. Let me rerun that video so you can get a sense of that. That barber pole is important. So again, we, we have all these different segments and we combine the light, uh, we measure the spectrum. And when we take that spectrum, the light from the two adjacent segments, because these segments aren't perfectly aligned, the light will be out of phase. And we measure that with this spectrum. And there'll be these little stripes in the spectrum. And as the segments get more and more into alignment, the pattern of the spectrum changes. There are fewer and fewer of these fringes until when the segments are perfectly aligned, the fringes disappear. And we apply this technique to different pairs of segments to link them together and thereby correct all the mirrors in the primary to be fully phased, as we say. Now, at this point, we need to do a little bit of further correction to the alignment because this process of adjusting the uh, mirror positions has gotten them a little out of alignment. We call this fine phasing. We do this again through each round of course phasing, and then routinely throughout Webb's lifespan to touch up the focus. And in this operation, we measure and correct the remaining alignment errors using the same defocusing method that we applied during segment alignment. But instead of using the secondary mirror to change the focus, we use special optical elements inside the science instrument to defocus the images. Finally, we arrive at this point where the telescope is well aligned but only at one point within the entire field of view of the telescope. That's not good enough to ensure the focus is good for all the rest of the instruments. We need to test the focus across the entire field of view to get all the instruments in focus. So here we make measurements of the image quality at different locations, and if we see differences, it means we need to tilt the secondary mirror or translate it to even out those focus variations. Now it turns out when we move the secondary mirror, we then have to make changes to the positions of those primary mirror segments to compensate. And the process of doing that means that carefully phased primary mirror becomes unfazed. And we have to backtrack and repeat some of our process of phasing the telescope again. That's another two weeks of work to get through that. So this is how we do it. At least this was the theory. Now I'm going to tell you what we've learned in the past few weeks about how it worked in practice. Everyone connected with the program was relieved and pleased that Webb launched and deployed successfully. But for our ball team, delivering Webb to L2 was only the start of the event, and we had to move forward on getting the telescope ready for science. So the first task was to see where the segments were pointed. After launch, we expected them to be randomly misaligned on the sky. So we started by taking dozens of images of the sky using the main camera on web and stitching them together digitally to form a mosaic of the sky. And we had success. We found the segments right where we expected. We took that image mosaic uh, by moving the camera and taking pictures of the sky and eventually found that the segment images were pretty much right where we expected them in the middle of the image. The next step is to identify the segments. This image shows the central part of that mosaic image that we took. And what we're seeing here may look to you like a star cluster, but that's not what it is. It's one star imaged 18 times with the different segments. 
One of our main concerns was that some of the mirrors wouldn't deploy properly. and We wouldn't see 18 segment images here. So we were ecstatic when we got this image and saw that indeed all 18 were there. It meant we were well on the way to success. So the next task, as I explained, was to figure out which of these images corresponds to which of the segments. So we sent commands to the spacecraft to tilt each segment in turn, took an image before and after each move, and noted which of these images moved when we tilted a different segment. And we continued that to locate all 18 of the segments. And that gave us this map showing which segment belonged to which image. And we were glad to see here that the wing segments, the ones that fold in and out, were more or less in the same location as those that are mounted on the stationary back plane. That told us immediately we should be able to align these images no problem. Knowing where each image was in uh, the segment map, we could then command them to form the array shape shown here. And to our optics experts, this was probably the most important image we took in the whole process. What do you note here? First of all, note that there are two segments that form donuts, unlike the rest. Those are the ones I've circled here. They're bigger and fuzzier than the others. And the question was why? Well, there were two possible reasons. Either the uh, segments were out of position relative to the secondary. In other words, they needed to be moved uh, toward the secondary or away from it to bring them into focus. Or it could be that their surface had the wrong curvature, that after launch, when they cooled down, they didn't cool to the right shape. If you guess right here, then the correction turns out to be simple. But if we guess wrong, we're gonna head off on the wrong path, make the wrong correction, and it could take us a week of time to undo those changes. So this was an important point. And after some head scratching, our experts decided the shape of two of these mirrors was wrong. And we sent shape corrections to those mirrors and uh, ended up making the right correction. But there's more information here. If you notice, I've circled a number of these images which are elongated, and, and those elongations all point toward the middle of the, um, of the image there. This is an important clue. It told us that there was some misalignment to the secondary mirror. So in addition to a couple of the segments having the wrong shape, we had a significant uh, change to make, a correction to the secondary. It didn't mean anything was wrong, this was expected, but it was important to adjust the secondary to get things into focus. So here's the image we got after we made those two tweaks, after we tweaked the positions or the, uh, the curvature of those segments and we corrected the secondary mirror, suddenly everything is much more in focus. Now we're well on the path to focusing the telescope. So that was a great image. We went through the remainder of the process and stacked the images up and the telescope is now forming a single image. All 18 of the segments are stacked. So are we done? You might think so, but look closer at the center of the image and here's what you see. What you notice here is that the image is mottled. It's speckled in technical terms. And the reason for that speckle is that the segments yes, are sir. slightly unfazed relative to each other. This is the effect of interference that occurs when you use segments that are not correctly phased. It took us an additional week to finish three more rounds of that coarse phasing, fine phasing process that I described earlier. And just a week ago, we finished. That was the celebration that I walked in on at the beginning of my last run. At this point, the telescope mirrors are aligned and phased. And to really appreciate what an accomplishment this is, it helps to compare this web image with the previous best image we could get in this same field with a different telescope. And here that is. This is a Spitzer view of that very same star. And if you blink back and forth between the two, it is astonishing the difference wow. that Webb makes. These blurry blobby things in the Spitzer image resolve into spectacularly sharp images in the Webb view. Hundreds of objects that were not visible before are jumping out at us. And this is only a 15 minute exposure, which is not very long at all with Webb. Imagine what this telescope is going to do when we really push it to its limits. It is going to be astonishing. If you look closely at that image, you can even see uh, many galaxies here. The detail is incredible. Those of us in the control room had a blast inspecting this image, looking at spirals, <laughs> galaxies, 
galaxies with dust lanes, ellipticals, and even a galaxy which appears to have been gravitationally lensed. Any image Webb takes on the sky is going to be a new Hubble Deep Field style image. So we're just a couple of months away from starting science observations with Webb. Let me run down some of the science we're going to hope to achieve. First, the search for the first light after the Big Bang. The holy grail for astronomers is to identify and observe the very first galaxies, and that means looking for the faintest and most distant ones, which represent the earliest ones. Here's a Hubble image of the ultra-deep field, with thousands of galaxies visible. Hubble can't access the wavelengths of light most sensitive to starlight at high redshift. And Spitzer doesn't have the resolution required, but Webb will provide a quantum leap in our ability to observe faint galaxies in the early universe, like the tiny little red blob circled there. That may be a galaxy that Webb will observe near the beginning of the universe. A second question is how galaxies were formed. We have mature theories backed up by a lot of evidence that tell us how galaxies form. Theories suggest that galaxies form as spirals and they interact through mergers and collisions. And these theories indicate that there's a key epoch of galaxy formation around 10 billion years ago. This is an era that's difficult to probe without an infrared telescope, but Webb will have the unprecedented ability to see galaxies in this era and reveal what processes are mainly responsible for driving the process of galaxy evolution. Nearby, Webb will allow us to view the wavelengths where stars in nearby galaxies emit most of their light and allow us to paint a fuller picture of the structure of nearby galaxies. Okay, a third goal is to observe how stars are born and evolve. Our understanding of how stars form is currently limited by our inability to get sharp images in the cores of dusty clouds that form new stars. Webb can see through the dust that blocks our views of distant stars within our own galaxy, helping us study what goes on there. We believe that as clouds of hydrogen gas collapse to form new stars, they go through a stage where they form a disk of swirling matter. Some of this matter condenses to form planets, but the main bulk of it in the center forms a star that turns on and then blows out the remaining gas into space. With Webb, we'll be able to see through the dust that currently blocks our views of stars within our own galaxy uh, forming within these dust clouds and see this process actually occurring in action. Finally, we want to understand how planets form and whether they can support life. How can we detect planets around other stars? Well, there's a couple of different ways. One is through a process of gravitational micro lensing. In this process, we stare at a distant star and wait for a star with a planet around it to pass between us. That process causes a magnification of the light from the distant star and allows us to measure a change in brightness. Similarly, we can measure transits of a planet across the surface of a star that cause a change in the brightness of a star. And this again allows us to detect faint exoplanets. And the ultimate goal with James Webb is actually to be able to take spectra of those faraway planets and actually measure the composition of the atmospheres of those planets and determine whether there are signatures of water and potentially even of life. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be the world's premier space observatory for some time to come. Its success lies not only in its fabulous optics, but in the many other systems that are working well. The instruments that take the data, the solar panels that give it power, the gyros that stabilize it, the attitude control system that keeps it pointed at targets for long exposures, and the ground systems that bring the data down. It is no accident that this all works. NASA learned from experience on previous missions and invested extensively in preparing for many possible contingencies. And that preparation is paying off in spades with a mission that's gone almost perfectly according to its script, besides being dauntingly complex. I'm proud of the work we at Ball have done and grateful for the contribution we could make to this global effort that involves thousands of scientists, engineers, and technicians from 14 nations, 29 states, and DC who contributed to build, test, and integrate web. The planned mission 
was five and a half years for Webb, which was limited by the onboard fuel supply. But because it had a favorable launch and orbital insertion, it arrived at its destination with enough fuel to operate for over 10 years. Now, at the start, I related the tale of a celebration we had a week ago when the Webb mirror was finally fully phased. That was a special day. But on Thursday, we had an even bigger toast to our success. Our team's optics expert, Scott Acton, had procured a particularly special bottle of cognac. It was special because it was bottled the very same year that James Webb was born, back in 1906. That evening, almost 100 of us gathered at the Space Telescope Science Institute to crack open his bottle and raise a toast to James Webb and the success of his mission. And here I am pictured celebrating with Nobel Prize winning physicist John Mather. Let us hope that the legacy of James Webb proves to be as long lasting as that cognac. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wirth. This is a, an amazing presentation. I think you see everybody clapping and wow. I'm, I'm sorry for the interruption. Sometimes people are, are not aware they have their, uh, they have their mics on. No worries. Um, we do have some questions for you and I wanted to, um, let people know i forgot to say this in the beginning if you have questions you can put them in the chat window and we will ask uh, dr worth your questions um let's see i'm going to start at the beginning and kate davis has the first one kate would you like to unmute and ask uh your first question I'm not seeing. Um, yes, sorry. <laughs> um, so my first question was, if we had the possibility to see planets like they used to be with this telescope, could we tell different certain things about the history of the changes of planets, like their atmospheres, what happened, like if there was some sort of fluids like water on the planet and what would we able to be able to tell about them or would they be too far away? So one of the key, that's a great question. One of the key goals of Webb is to be able to take measurements of the atmospheres of exoplanets. It's a very challenging uh, thing to accomplish, but it is nonetheless something that NASA wants to uh, wants to promote and and try. Um, so in terms of what we'll be able to learn uh, by taking the spectrum of an exoplanet's atmosphere we can potentially determine uh, whether there are signatures of uh, elements associated with life or things associated with life, such as uh, water, uh, carbon dioxide, other elements that you might see in a planet that harbors life could potentially be visible in the spectrum of an exoplanet. So that's definitely something that people are going to be looking for. Great, thank you. Ron, you have the next question about beryllium. Yes, uh, thanks. Wonderful presentation, Dr. Wood. Thank you very much. Uh, question about the mirrors. Is the beryllium uh, pure or is it an alloy? As far as I know, what we're working with is pure beryllium. I believe it comes from a special mine in Utah, which is the source of uh, most of the beryllium uh, that, that we use in the, in the U.S. And uh, yeah, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not a metallurgist, but uh, uh, as far as I know, it's, it's just pure beryllium that, that goes into those mirrors. It turns out to be a very difficult substance to work with. Uh, it's highly uh, toxic if, if you ingest the, uh, if you breathe in the dust. So you need a very special uh, setup to be able to safely work with beryllium. That's why we didn't attempt to do it uh, by ourselves at Ball. We hired a company that had experience in being able to manufacture things out of beryllium to do this. Thank you. Wow, what an effort. Uh, Caitlin had the third question about the resilience of the sun shield. Caitlin, you can unmute and ask the question. Oh, <laughs> yeah. um, just uh, how resilient is the sun shield against like debris or space dust? And um, does it does the telescope have any 
self-correcting um, or protective like repair measures? Like what can it do, you know, if um, some little bit of something gets caught somewhere? So in terms of the resilience of the sun shield um, to dust, I'm not sure dust itself presents much of a problem, but there are going to be micrometeoroids and, and things that impact the sun shield. And this material is, uh, it's called CAPTA. It's basically, I believe, a, a plastic that's coated with uh, a metallic surface. It's extremely thin because it needed to be light to be launched into space. And uh, it is going to provide absolutely no protection to the uh, the spacecraft if a micrometeoroid comes through. It's going to just uh, go right through that plastic, hopefully not tearing it uh, too much, but uh, it's definitely not going to stop the uh, the micrometeoroids. Now, what happens if a micrometeoroid hits the main mirror? Is there any provision for repair? In a word, nope. Um, we expect that over time, things are going to impact those mirrors. And uh, matter of fact, there was some speculation that we may already have seen one very minor um, impact on the mirrors in the course of the commissioning so far. Uh, over time, those mirrors are going to be struck. They are going to degrade. And um, <clears throat> short of sending out some robotic repair uh, device, which hasn't been invented yet, there's, there's really nothing we can do about it. So uh, we expect that over time, uh, the exposure to space is going to uh, take its toll. But the mission is planned to do well, hopefully for, for 10 years. But there's there's nothing to stop some meteoroid from from uh, hitting it tomorrow and knocking it uh, out of commission. It would be incredibly unlucky, but uh, could certainly happen. Okay, thank you for that answer. Joe Pineda, you have the next question about pointing. Okay, thank you. Uh, very nice presentation. Um, the question I have is uh, pointing. Um, it seemed like that any vibration at all, uh, a relay closing, the gimbling of the S band antenna or whatever that is, and the uh, any anything at all could could cause drift for, for long exposures. How did, how did you solve that problem? You know, uh, I don't think anything uh, close to the size of Webb has has been accurately pointed to the extent that this in, this telescope will need to be. So it, it's a challenge, and uh, you know, there's still tuning it. They will continue to tune it uh, throughout the, the first part of the mission here. We're just now getting to the point where we're going to be turning on uh, what's called the uh, the cryo cooler. This is a device that is needed to bring the mid-infrared camera on web down to near absolute zero so that it can take images in the infrared. And so, so that's a, that closed cycle cooler is going to create vibrations. And what we'll be doing is we'll be measuring how much vibration it induces on the observatory. And we have the ability to tune that cryo cooler to change the frequency of its operation so that it uh, doesn't uh, cause resonances within the structure. So uh, basically the, the message is it's a work in progress, but there are ways that they can tweak the system to try to minimize the impact of moving things on the pointing of the, the observatory, because you're right. It, when you go put a telescope in space, you want to be able to take full advantage of the sharp images you get there. You don't want the telescope to be vibrating and the image to be moving. So a lot of attention has been paid to that. But so far, indications are that it's capable of really superb pointing. I think they were measuring uh, jitter, as we call it, on the scale of sub milli arc second, oh which God. is astonishing. So it's it's going to be spectacular, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Amazing. Josh Ellis, you have the next question about the mirror movements. Um, yeah, you mentioned that the um, mirrors could be moved to within like nanometer precision. Um, how is that possible? It's possible through some really astounding mechanical work that went on at Ball. There's actually, I mentioned earlier that there were some patents associated with Ball's work on this, and the actuators that make these moves are one of those patents. There was recently a fabulous YouTube video that somebody put together uh, based on a reading of a paper that Ball published on these amazing actuators. This fellow reverse engineered the design and built a working model of the Ball actuators and posted a 10-minute explanation of how they work 
on YouTube. So if you Google uh, JWST actuators, I, I think on YouTube, you, you can find his video. He does a fantastic job explaining uh, the amazing way that they work. And it's, it's not simply that they can move very precisely, but also that they can move very precisely over a wide range. You have something that can move to nanometer precision over a range of uh, several centimeters, which is uh, astonishing. And it's one of the key uh, technological drivers that, uh, that is making Web a success. Hmm. All right. Um, thank you. And thank you for the presentation. My pleasure. That's wonderful. And the next question is mine. Um, looking at how thin the sun shield segments were, how much do each of those weigh? Oh, uh, you know, I, I don't have that number off the top of my head. Uh, y you can imagine that they are uh, pretty, pretty thin. Um, but but they're large, right? The size of a tennis mm -hmm. court. So I, I've not worked out uh, exactly how much mass is in those. But uh, it's, it's you know it's like gossamer um, mm -hmm. uh, protection up there in space. So they're mm -hmm. they're presumably as, as as thin as they could be, and and still work. Um, so they're they're pretty amazing. Yeah, I would imagine they're quite light. I just Indeed. amazing technology. And by the way, I love the Lego JWST. <laughs> I, lot lot of Lego people in my family, and so there will definitely be at least one <laughs> that I, I, I suspect, own. <laughs> suspect that will potentially end up under a lot of astronomers Christmas trees if it comes yes. out this year. Yes, yes. Okay, back to Kate Davis for the next question about servo motors. Kate, um, you yeah. can go ahead. Sorry. I was just wondering um, if what kind of motor you use to control each of those small mirror movements, and you kind of answered it before for Josh's question, but um, just like what specifically did you use? Um, because I know that a servo a servo motor works similar to that to with like a basic input output function with the commands. So I wasn't entirely sure. A great question. I, unfortunately, I'm not a, a uh, an engineer. Truly, I'm I'm a scientist, and uh, I'm, my engineering friends would be able to answer that. I unfortunately don't know the details of uh, of, of the motors that are, are used to make those moves. So I'm, I'm afraid I can't help you there. But I. Uh, Again, I, I think checking out that video that I recommended might shed some light. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, Mark Chrisman, your question next about the location of the launch. Yes, um, I was wondering why, uh, why was it launched from French Guiana of all places? Sure, so, um, well, first of all, uh, the Europeans' contribution to this multinational program was to provide the launch vehicle. And uh, launching on the Ariane uh, vehicle made great sense because it's been an exceptionally reliable uh, platform, which is absolutely what you want when you're putting your $10 billion space telescope onto a rocket. Um, so it made great sense from that standpoint. Um, but being on the equator, uh, a launch site on the equator has uh, definite advantages. The closer you are to the equator when you launch, the greater velocity your rocket launch can impart to the payload. And uh, that means you need a little less fuel to get it to a, a certain velocity in space. So um, I believe that's the, the, the main attraction there, is, is the equatorial position of the launch site. Mm, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Tony Mike Sell posted a link um, about making your own mirror controllers, a YouTube link there, and I haven't had time, of course, to look at it, but thank you, Tony, for putting that up. Um, Ron, your question is next about the diffraction spikes. Um, as you were showing us that, that final alignment image that, that uh, clearly showed the, uh, the background galaxies and so on, I noticed diffraction spikes around the the star in the center of the image. And I was curious if those diffraction spikes were caused by the secondary support struts or something else. Ah, that is an insightful question. Let me pop that image back up because I love showing that. And because I actually learned something about this uh, 
to can I go backwards here let's see um, stop the share no don't stop the share stop the video presentation and let's go back to that image and just take a little closer look at the image here so I'm gonna put that back up yeah so if you've seen images from the ground from say the Keck telescope or other telescopes you're familiar with diffraction spikes that are usually caused by the secondary support. Now, if you'll note here, we are seeing six spikes, and it turns out that there are not six supports for the JWST secondary. There are only three, and they are not uh, 120 degrees apart. They're, they're something different. So what is the nature of those diffraction spikes in this image? It turns out that the diffraction we see here is caused not by the secondary support, but by the gaps that occur between those hexagonal segments. So those diffraction spikes are aligned with that hexagonal pattern, and it's the gaps between the, uh, the mirrors that create that. And it's not visible here, but if you see this in full resolution, uh, you'll be able to see that the, each of those spikes when you magnify it is not a single shaft of light but actually a series of, of parallel stripes and that has to do with the spacing of the uh, the mirrors i believe it's the gap between them that that defines that now there's another feature here the horizontal one yes. um, what is what is that about where do, what does that come from and this one actually is from the secondary support now, I know the next thing you're going to say is, why is there only one horizontal stripe when there are three uh, supports for the secondary mirror? And if I can go back to one of the other images in the sequence here that shows us the mirror, maybe we could just use this one, for example. Um, and let me put in the mode here put the laser pointer so it turns out that we have one um one support that goes right through the a1 and b1 segments aligned like that and i believe that is the one that is creating that horizontal um uh, feature in the diffraction spike and but the other two uh supports trace this gap between the A4 and A5 segments, and then the gap between the A3 and the A4 segments. So they are less prominent and, and producing less of a, a diffraction spike there for us. So um, at least this is what my optics experts friends tell me is going on in that image. So uh, that may be more information than you wanted to know, but uh, I just- That just, answers the question nicely, thank you. Interested to share that with you. Yes, thank you. You bet. <laughs> we, we often have people who love a lot of details, so that was very good. Great. Uh, July has the next question about the Lagrange point. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering if you could discuss a bit about the Lagrange point. I know it's a gravi gravitationally stable location. And number two question was how long before w w or JWST starts to get optimal images? Number three, how often will data be received from the telescope? Okay, so let's start with the Lagrange points. So um, there are, I think, six Lagrange points in a two-body system. So when I say two-body, I mean we're talking about the sun and the earth in this case. So um, the two um, most stable Lagrange points form an equilateral triangle between those three. So if you put the sun at one part of the triangle, the earth at the other, and then have the... Uh, the Lagrange point is, is the third point on that equilateral triangle. And of course, there's one this way and there's one this way. And those are the stable Lagrange points. I forget, there's L3 and 4. Um, and that's, for example, where you find the, uh, the Trojan asteroids that uh, follow or, or precede Jupiter in its orbit. So things can stay there indefinitely. Um, then there are also Lagrange points that are aligned on the Earth-Sun axis. So if you, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have figures to do this. I'm trying to do this hand wavy here. But if you have the Sun and the Earth, 
there is a point in between the sun and the earth where the gravitational force of those two bodies is equal. And it, of course, it's much closer to the earth because the earth has smaller gravitational uh, pull. So that I think is the, I think the L1 point is between the earth and the sun. And then the other side of the earth, so sun, earth, uh, go beyond the earth, then you reach the L2 point. And I believe both the L1 and L2 Lagrange points are only semi-stable. An object can remain there for a while, but it will eventually drift away. Uh, and that's why Webb needs some fuel to uh, keep tweaking its position back close to that L2 position. And then uh, there are other Lagrange points on the other side of the sun from the earth. Um, and you can check the Wikipedia article on Lagrange points for information on that. Uh, so that's Lagrange points, and I've already forgotten what the second question you asked was. Could you repeat? Uh, how long before the telescope starts to get optimal, optimal images, and how often will data be received from the telescope? Great. So how long until we have optimal images? Uh, we are probably uh, <clears throat> a, a month away from uh, finishing the process of tweaking the optics. Then there are some additional things that need to take place to get the instruments ready for science. It's hoped that the first science results will start, or the first science data will start being generated sometime early this summer. So look for it to happen in June or thereabouts. And how often will data from Webb come down? I uh, believe the, well, we've been taking data with Webb in the process of trying to do the, uh, uh, the alignment process here. Uh, the Deep Space Network is on in nearly constant contact with Webb, so the data will be coming down uh, pretty much as soon as it's taken. There are occasional outages when one of the sites is unable to talk to Webb, but uh, it should should be on a nearly continuous basis that Webb is sending down images. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, my question is next. How much of the ongoing team is employed at Ball? The ongoing team um, is entirely employed at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Ball's role in this process ends when we deliver the fully functioning telescope to NASA. We think that will be in about a month. And that's going to be a very sad time for those of us on our team because our work will be done. We will say, here you go, NASA, and we will go on our own way to other projects. So this team that's been working together and uh, carrying out this process for so long is going to scatter to the winds, sadly. Oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry to hear that. Wow. Well, what do you have lined up for your future then? <laughs> I'm still waiting for my next assignment. My boss has yet to tell me. So I um, see. Trying to focus on uh, finishing up our work on web and trusting that something exciting will come along. Thank you. Well, we have some comments. Uh, Kate says this was amazing. Marcus says, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. Ron says, great presentation. Thank you very much. Greg Fogarty has the next question. Um, thank you for a very fascinating speech. I've got a very simplistic question. Do you know what the first official target is or region, or region of the sky? Uh, as, as far as I know, that has not yet been determined. Uh, what has been determined is which observing teams have been granted time on the web uh, during the first year of operation. That has been allocated. But until we know the date when we're turning the telescope over to science, uh, we're not able to create a, a specific plan for which observations will take place in which order. Just like our telescopes on Earth, uh, the availability, the accessibility of a given target in the sky depends upon what time of year we're observing. So until we know exactly when we're going to start observing, we don't know what uh, what we're going to be doing. So, for example, it would make great sense if the first science target were to look at the Hubble Deep Field or the Hubble Ultra Deep Field or the Hubble Extreme Deep Field to demonstrate the power of the telescope against its predecessor. But um, 
the Hubble Deep Field may or may not be available on the first day when they want to start taking data. Um, uh, or maybe they're going to use Jupiter as the first target. Who I, I really don't know what their, their plans are, but it will be hopefully uh, amazing, whatever it is that we look at. And I think we all look forward to seeing that. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't depend, I mean, directionally, when you're looking for remnants of the early universe, it can be pointed in any direction, correct? Uh, yeah, basically any point in the sky that you direct web and stare for a long time, you are going to see um, distant galaxies. But given that, I mean, there's a reason they chose these particular spots to point Hubble for the Hubble deep field. You, you want a point that is, uh, you know, devoid of, uh, of bright stars and, and gas that could block your view. You want a point in the sky that can be observed by the giant telescopes on the ground like Keck and VLT that will be able to follow up observations with spectra to study those those objects. So um, <clears throat> while you could point to any random point in the sky, it's likely that uh, the first attention will be given to those well-studied areas that Hubble has already stared at. Uh-huh. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Richard Schutz has the next question. Um, hi. Uh, thanks. That was a great talk. I love that. It's sad that the telescope's only going to last 10 years. Um, what's the next telescope in, in the works then? It seems like we'd already have to have it um, being put together. Oh, well, that's great news. So, you know, Webb has been in the pipeline uh, Technically, work started on it uh, right around 2000, but actually the first discussions about what to build after Hubble started before Hubble was launched back in 1989. They laid the groundwork for Webb. So in terms of what comes after JWST, first of all, I didn't mean to say that JWST will only have a 10-year lifetime. I meant to say that James Webb should have enough fuel to work for at least 10 years, perhaps longer. Uh, and who's to say that we won't figure out a way to refuel it by sending a robot out there with a gas can? Um, slight joke there. Anyway, the, uh, the, the successor, the next big thing after uh, the Webb telescope is going to be the Roman Space Telescope. Uh, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope will launch sometime late in this decade, and it is going to be exceptionally powerful. Um, and I encourage you to invite me back to give you a talk about the Roman Space Telescope because Ball is helping build the key instrument on that one as well. And I'll be happy to fill you in on the amazing things that it can do. So Roman is to follow up. And uh, just in the last few months, the astronomical community has come out with a recommendation for the next set of uh, the next telescope it wants to build, which is uh, comparable in size to web, but will be even more powerful with the ability to work in the ultraviolet, the uh, ability to add additional instrumentation for studying exoplanets. And um, <clears throat> this is going to be ho hopefully something that NASA considers moving forward on. And if they do, it will potentially be launched uh, sometime around 2040 or so. These space missions take a long time to develop. So I do not still plan to be working when we get around to building and launching that next telescope. But hopefully that is to come. Wonderful. Thank you. A couple more compliments from Sam Andrews and Richard Graylin. Incredible presentation. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, Mateo, uh, do you want to uh, come on camera and ask your question about the Sun shield. Uh, how does the sun, sun shield work? I wasn't here for the whole presentation, so I missed some of it. No problem. So uh, the way the sun shield works is that uh, we unfurl this thin sheet of material that is reflective on one side. Uh, it's an enormous sheet of material about the size of a tennis court, and it's in five separate layers because any one of these layers 
only reflects a certain amount of light, but if you put five of them in a row, they can re uh, reject most of the light coming from the sun. And we keep that sun shield always pointed toward the sun, and we keep the web telescope, the mirrors, on the other side. So there's a hot side facing the sun, and there's a cold side facing away from the sun, and that reduces the temperature of web from uh, it would be around 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Instead, it will be almost minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's a 600 degree temperature difference that this sun shield makes. It's quite amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jack Eastman says superb presentation. And uh, Jack is our, our local our retiree from Lockheed Martin. Um, he worked on some optics that flew on the Cassini spacecraft. Fabulous. Yes. Uh, Zach Singer, your turn for a question. Oh. Zach? Howdy. Yeah, I just had to get the unmute button. It always takes a second. <laughs> um, so uh, once again, like everyone else said, thank you. That was a, a really cool presentation. Um, and with regard to this, um, the presentation said something about uh, testing everything beforehand makes good sense while it's in a vacuum, uh, while it's uh, in very cold conditions, because that's going to simulate the rigors of space. Um, but what about uh, in that testing facility, the gravity from, from Earth? So how did you compensate for all that? Well, in Oh, in a word, you can't because we don't have a zero G test facility anywhere on Earth. You know, we, we sometimes send people up in the vomit comet that NASA runs to uh, the airplane that, that puts you into zero G for for a minute or two at a time. But we just can't do that with something as huge as Webb. So we have to make educated guesses uh, about how things are going to behave in zero G. Uh, you know, one one thing we can do, say we, we have a mirror and we're trying to understand how it will behave in space, we might, instead of just testing it in one orientation, we might test it in various orientations. And if it works in all of those orientations, we can be reasonably confident it might work in the zero G environment. That's one example of a, an approach we might take to try to uh, to suss that out. But it's uh, it's challenging to. So to did you actually look for differences in those orientations? Say, OK, well, it's so much this way and so much that way. And you kind of look for an average point. Or... Yeah, yeah. I, I believe that's the principle that they employed when they tested out the optics. Otherwise, how is the cognac? <laughs> <laughs> With a hundred people sharing this bottle of cognac, you can imagine that we each got uh, a, a microscopic amount. So it was it was uh, to be savored, not gulped. And uh, I, I I wish I were uh, a, a cognac aficionado and could tell you how fabulous it was, but all I could tell you is we we enjoyed it. Yeah, you have a time for another one then. Another question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, sure. What is the range of motion on the web when you're pointing? Because you have to keep the sun shield between the scope and the sun. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So at, at best, you got, what, 180, maybe a little more if you got the angles. But mechanically or by whatever factor, what can you really get away with? I believe that I've seen the number as being uh, 45 degrees relative to the anti-sun position. So um, from the anti-sun position, you can tilt one way or the other by 45 degrees at a time. I think that's the the uh, cone of accessibility. So that affects your calendar then with regard to the other fellow's question. Partly why it's not scheduled depends when you get there because certain times of the year, if you will, or you know, certain times in its orbit, I guess that's the operative issue. It's gonna have certain targets and parts of the sky accessible and certain parts not. That's right. And now that I'm thinking about it, I. I think the 45 degrees may refer to not how far we can point off of the anti-sun position, but how far off the uh, telescope, the, the observatory axis we can point. I think the observatory also has the ability to change position relative to the sun because um, there are times when we are not doing an observation that they want to tilt the entire spacecraft to what they call the, uh, the full power position where the solar panels take maximum advantage of their orientation and can generate the most power. So I think we've got two things going on there. You can tilt the observatory as a whole and you can tilt the telescope 
relative to the observatory. And I, I guess that would be necessary in order to reach certain points in the sky. Thank you. Sure. Okay, very good. Joe Pineda, you have a question about the star in the first image? Yeah, first slide. I was just curious what that star was. You know, it was a random star that um, uh, they just chose from a catalog. They said, give me a ninth magnitude star with nothing else nearby. It was not special at all. In fact, um, there was a press conference last uh, Wednesday, I think it was, a NASA press conference where they talked about the observation. And the, uh, the, the NASA person uh, who was in charge of the program spoke to one of the uh, primary people who's been in charge of the work at Space Telescope and said, oh, tell me about this star that you chose to look at. What's its spectral type? And um, the uh, person from Space Telescope went and looked it up and it has actually never been observed before. We don't know its spectral type. It's just such a garden variety star. There are many garden variety stars up in space that are so unremarkable, nobody's ever looked at them. And this is one of them. That's how random it was. We don't even know what spectral type it is. But it's interesting that people have now gone back and, and looked at that, that first image. And it uh, turns out there's one galaxy in that field whose redshift has been measured. It turns out to be a redshift of about 0.3, which means it's moderately distant. Um, but that's the only only object in that whole field that's ever been observed before. Every time we point this telescope to some place in the sky, we're gonna make new discoveries. And there's some people who are probably gonna follow up on these random galaxies that we've observed in that first image and do some great science. Thank you. Wonderful, great. Okay, Keith Mahoney has a question about the data rate. Yeah, what's the uh, the data rate from the uh, antenna from uh, the telescope to the ground? And uh, do you know the amount of storage that you have on the telescope uh, Boy, that you can I, store? To be honest, I don't. Um, okay. I, I am not that familiar with it. I know that uh, you know we're we're taking data not at a very furious pace on web. The detectors are modest in size by modern standards. Uh, um, so they're, they're not enormous detectors that send down data at a very high rate. Um, I, I, so basically, no, I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you that. I imagine the information uh, is available, but I just don't carry those numbers in my head. All right, thank you. Um, Hugh Davidson has a couple of questions. Go ahead, Hugh. Yeah, the first question, I had understood there was a problem with a tearing of the sun shield during testing. And I was wondering if you could address that, uh, what, what, what about that and how that problem was fixed. So the sun shield did have some problems during the testing. This was before I was on the program. So what I'm telling you is just what I picked up from the news. I believe that it wasn't that the sun shield tore. I believe the issue was that the, uh, the sun shield is secured to the spacecraft through some sort of, uh, of hanger with a, with, which has a bolt on it. And in the process of doing the vibration testing on the spacecraft, a number of those bolts or nuts um, came undone. And uh, obviously, if that were to happen when uh, we were up in space, it would be catastrophic. The sun shield would, would not deploy properly. And so the fact that these bolts came off was a big red flag. And NASA had to uh, work with the contractor, go back to the drawing board, and make some changes to the design of that sun shield system in order to ensure that it would deploy properly. And, Quite obviously, it, it has. So they apparently made the right design changes to give us a well-working sun shield. Good. Um, the second question I had is, uh, do you think the, uh, the web will get close to the Big Bang origins? And uh, will the web uh, be working complementary with the 39-meter uh, meter, uh, European Extreme Large Telescope once it becomes online? The short answer is yes to both. So on um, will it get back close to the Big Bang? Uh, yes, the, the goal of astronomers is to find the most distant 
uh, galaxies, which are the earliest ones that have formed. We are limited in our ability to do that by our uh, ability to see well into the infrared, uh, which is where those redshifted objects emit most of their light. Webb has been designed to allow us to get to some of those earliest galaxies. So I, th I think we're going to see the, the frontiers of, of uh, distant galaxies moved back significantly by Webb to a time when the first galaxies were forming. Now, once those objects are observed, we'll want to follow up with them from the ground. And uh, the next generation of uh, extremely large telescopes will be ideally suited to doing some of that work. But uh, remember, they are limited as well. If you've got an object that emits all of its light in the uh, near to mid infrared, and you're trying to observe it from the ground, uh, it's going to be challenging. The water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere uh, absorbs a lot of infrared light. The Earth's atmosphere degrades the images and makes it difficult to see them clearly. So uh, there are limitations, obviously, to what you can do from the ground. But people are absolutely going to use web, uh, use the ground-based telescopes to follow up and make observations of the exciting things that Webb discovers, no doubt. All right, All right thank you. Thank you. Um, our last question is from July. Yes, you mentioned the little dipper in your bio. I was wondering if you have a favorite constellation and if you have any opportunities for stargazing with your busy career. Oh, well, I'm gonna go out on a limb. I'm, I'm gonna say, uh, uh, Scorpio is, is my favorite constellation. Uh, it, when I lived in Hawaii, we knew it as Maui's fish hook. Um, and Antares is just such a cool red star in the heart of the scorpion. How could you not love that? So that's, that's my, uh, that's my go-to constellation. Uh, do I get time for stargazing? Yes, I do. I have a, a childhood friend actually, um, offered me, donated to me her, her beautiful schmidt cassegrain telescope, the kind I, uh, drooled over when I was a, a young astronomer, and, and now that I'm an older astronomer, I finally get to have the telescope of my my dreams. I had a lot of fun uh, last spring taking it down to uh, sand dunes, great sand dunes, and seeing the amazingly dark skies there. And uh, I, I wish I got out more. Intended to get out more last summer, but we had these wildfires that made it really lousy to try to go out and see things at night. So I'm hoping for fewer wildfires this year and more stargazing. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Wirth. It's been a real pleasure having you here. Um, I'm going to make sure that Dr. Ensoy has your contact information so we can follow up with you about the Roman telescope later on. And, um, you know, feel free to drop in on us um, you have my contact information and, uh, you know, we'd love to have you, uh, drop in on any of our future meetings or events at Chamberlain Observatory. Uh, we're, we're hoping to be back in person soon. So, uh, but this has been a wonderful presentation. We're, we're very grateful that you took the time out of your, your visit with your daughter to, uh, to do this for us. If uh, everybody would show your appreciation, please do. We're very, very happy to have had you here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the live stream now, if I can remember how to do